Did any of you stop and think for a second that Breath of the Wild may not have been a 10 out of 10? <laughs> Unpopular opinions. I have them, you have them, we all have them. They're like bacteria. And just like bacteria, at some point you're going to spread them all over somebody else and make them sick and miserable. Look, I'm really not trying to go out of my way to upset anyone. That's not why I make videos. But you have to admit, unpopular opinions online are basically the equivalent of pond scum. No one likes it. Yet it all rises to the top and everybody sees it. For whatever reason, we all just love a good trash fire when people claim to be above the filth and no more than the majority, but that is not what I'm doing today. Look at me. I know Dingle Dangle. I just love sharing my subjective views on things and seeing how people react. So before I regret what I'm doing, sit back, get some tea, and join me in my dirty bathwater. <laughs> I can sell this! As I give you even more of my unpopular gaming opinions. First off, does anyone else here think that Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee are the best versions of Pokemon Gen 1? Cause I do. I remember when Pokemon first came out all those years ago. How all the children played. How they all laughed. How they all kicked each other to the floor when they lost. How they used scissors on the cards of other kids they didn't like. Look, I even have this card here that I stole over 17 years ago. And you can tell I stole it because the guy it belonged to used to hole punch his cards so they knew they were his. I don't even remember the guy's name, but I remember his cardboard. That's what Pokemon did to friendships back in the day. And so unsurprisingly, I was never allowed to play the Game Boy games when I was younger. But yeah. one of my cousins was, and so I sneakily borrowed Pokemon Yellow from him, played it on my GBA, and was hooked ever since. The problem with Pokemon Yellow, Blue, and Red, though, is that for the classics that they are, Going back to them today is like reading really old issues of Time magazine. You probably shouldn't. It's as basic of an RPG as you can get, and that was fine for the time, but remaking the world of Gen 1 for the Switch took every correct avenue. It's the same story and same locations, but with a huge graphical overhaul, better sounding music, and yeah, the random wild Pokemon battles were gone, but pray tell, what the hell is wrong with that decision? Because now, not only can you physically see the Pokemon so you can control when you want to fight instead of being interrupted every 10 seconds, but it makes completing the Pokedex 100 times less of a ball ache since you know exactly what you should be looking for before wasting time in a battle screen for the millionth zoo bat. Leave me alone, damn you! Don't make me get the blankie out! Oh, what? There's no battling wild Pokemon at all in this version? Again, who cares? The newer games are way better at battling than Gen 1 is nowadays, and so instead you get a really fun catching mini game that rewards more XP based on timing and positioning with throwing a Pokeball, with status effects you can control, all the spare Pokemon you catch then being traded for a load of stat boosting candies for your current Pokemon, and you still get the dozens upon dozens of trainer and gym leader battles anyway. If if anything, this system staves off the repetition for a remake, and by halving the focus between battling and catching, they kept the original goal of Gen 1 Pokemon consistent despite the differences. It's welcoming to brand new players and smaller kids especially that are just getting into games, and is way more interesting than original Gen 1's version of simply giving you hundreds of battles repeated ad nauseum without everything else supplementing it like in the newer games. And let's not forget the epic Mega Revolutions which can save your life in more difficult battles, and hey, the ability to do all the situational moves in the overall world like water skimming, tree cutting, lighting up dark caves and fast travel flying all linked to your singular starter Pokemon was a genius decision. Saving up your space and not forcing you to carry around a Pokemon that you would only use for a singular purpose in the overworld. That though? Pfft. That was tame. You haven't caught my bacterial opinion disease yet so let's crank it up a notch. Do any of you remember Dark Souls? What if I told you that the gameplay in Dark Souls, more specifically, the combat system, how you interact with the enemies, the bosses, and the world around you, isn't actually that great? And I say this with all the love in my veins which are basically withered. Dark Souls and Bloodborne are both in my top 5 video games ever made. But when I took a step back to think of why that is exactly, I realised it wasn't the combat system on its own. You want to know what you do mostly in Dark Souls? You get to an enemy or boss, equip a magic catalyst or melee weapon, dodge a series of attacks or use a shield on the rare occasion to block or parry, and then hit back once or twice when it's safe. I mean yeah, if you want to be spindly specific there's a little more than that, but as a whole that's mostly what you as a player are doing to engage with the game mechanics. Like, if you compare this to Bayonetta or something with the insane amounts of combos, situational attacks, different kinds of enemy behaviour that requires jumping or dodging, dodging at the very last second to slow down time, incredibly fast ranged attacks to tie into combos, finishing moves, all that stuff. Dark Souls and Bloodborne don't actually have much going on aside from strong and light attacks that string together over and over again, a universal dodge, and a shield that mostly doesn't even work with bosses. It's the atmosphere, the level design, the vast array of place 
stars and character builds, the replayability, the visuals, the music, the epic encounters and tense, horrific standard exploration in pitch black, grimy corridors of unspeakable terror. All that stuff works in tangent with how hard the enemies hit you to almost give you the sensation of a survival horror game. Helped along by the huge amount of weight and planning to your attacks and the limited risk and reward healing system. Dark Souls and Bloodborne are the prime examples of games that are way, way more than the sum of their parts. How you control your character is one thing, but it's how that is built around everything else around you that makes the game so brilliant. And that is also why games like Lords of the Fallen fall down. The, the Lords fell down. Lords of the Plagiarists! I don't like the music in Metal Gear Rising. And with that comment alone, I'm absolutely certain I've made some enemies because almost every other person I've spoken to about the OST in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance have nothing but the highest praise for it or are just okay with it being there. I've never had anyone agree with me when I say I find it irritating. I'm talking more about the vocal tracks by the by and it's so popular to the point where if you search Metal Gear Rising on YouTube, not only will Metal Gear Rising OST be the first search term, but even Metal Gear Rising Revengeance OST will be just below it. People love this soundtrack so much that they're willing to type in the entire shitting name of Metal Gear Rising Revengeance in order to be specific enough to find the soundtrack for Metal Gear Rising. I'm saying Metal Gear Rising a lot, aren't I? Maybe I should Metal Gear SHUT UP! I enjoy the game fine enough as a game, but yeah, as far as the soundtrack goes, nope, I'm not a fan at all. I've tried listening to it in the context of the game and outside of the game, and I can't stand it each and every time. I also think the lyrics to some of the songs are totally bloody intelligible, but then again, that may be because I'm deaf as a door handle. Hello! The vocal sound is way too whiny for me and switches between phlegmy screeching and twangy singing a little too abruptly for my ear to get accustomed to it. And where I like the idea of mixing more metal sounds with techno beats and aggressive synths, what I don't like is how this soundtrack smashes them together like a car crash. It just sounds like a wall of noise with too much happening at once for me. Unfortunately though, like your sense of humour, your taste in music is one of the most subjective things you could bring up in a video about opinions. I mean, one man's ear candy is another man's... ear wet far. But I reckon I can get the unpopular opinion bacteria spreading again with my next opinion that Zelda Hyrule Warriors is really boring. Ah. <laughs> <gasps> uh. There's a disease. Can we all agree on one thing for a second? That being that Hyrule Warriors is really stupid. Like, it's so stupid that if it were a person, it would think Cooking Mama was a video game about cooking your own mother. Good, glad we got that out of the way. In which case, with it being so stupid and looking like it completely goes all out with its stupidity, why did I find it painfully boring to play? It looked unbelievably cool when I saw trailers, but when I finally got around to it, I felt like I had no impact on anything around me. The enemies, no matter how big or aggressive, all felt like paper bags being blown around with my repetitive combos and special moves. I know this is basically Dynasty Warriors, so I guess that means I wouldn't enjoy that either, but all I found myself doing for hours and hours was running to the objective, clearing out waves and waves of sword fodder, getting to the main commander, doing the same thing, and then moving on until a boss, and this would be fine for me if there was any depth, but if there was supposed to be some here, I couldn't find it. It felt so damn mundane to me, so mindless, like I could play it with my eyes half closed. It didn't matter if I was switching between different characters either, they all feel different to play, sure, but it restricts them with a game that is still about doing the same thing over and over again. Where it's amazing fun and real engaging for like 10 minutes, where you see the special moves activate for the first time and laugh your gizzard off as you essentially fix all the problems of your entire army by coughing over your enemies. <coughs> After doing it 20 more times over, over with not much else changing, I kinda just wanted to stop. What didn't help either was the original Wii U version running pretty badly when that came out, and then the supposed definitive edition on Switch not running that well either. I mean, it was an improvement, but... <laughs> While we're moaning at Nintendo though, let's pair them up with Sony for a second, because you know something? I reckon that Nintendo and Sony could benefit from copying Microsoft a little bit more. Okay, I can't just make that statement without going into a little bit more detail, can I? Wouldn't that be silly? So here's an advertisement. You want an unpopular opinion? Well, here's my most unpopular opinion of all. Isn't hacking brilliant? Wouldn't it be a shame if you could stop it from happening to you? Well, if you press this button right here, you'll be connected to ExpressVPN, the sponsors for today's video. And VPN stands for Victor's PP. Nice. And if you think ExpressVPN only lets you look at Victor from the waist down, 
You're right. But it will protect your credit card details when you pay to see that. And this service doesn't stop there. It keeps your usernames and passwords secure whenever you use public Wi-Fi too, which I do a lot when I'm at hotels for conventions saying hello to you lovely lot. Ah! Even if you only use the internet for online gaming, you're safe there too since ExpressVPN encrypts all your data to reduce damage from DDoS attacks and even allows you to access geo-restricted servers or get early access to games launched in different countries. Not to mention, look how fast it is. This VPN is so fast it makes me go ah! Get it on all of these, whichever you prefer. Pick the server location out of 94 different countries and take back your internet privacy today by heading to the link in the description, expressvpn.com forward slash caddy, where you'll find out how to get three months of this service for free. And hey, don't just listen to me, other websites love it too. Anyway, yeah, when I say that Nintendo and Sony can take a page or two from Microsoft's books, that sounds a little bit redundant. These three companies have rode off and on each other so much over the years, they're practically raw, but in today's market, something I didn't realise about Xbox is that despite their most recent console being a bit of a mess in my opinion, Microsoft more than any other company, even since the 360, have been pretty consistent with providing a decent level of backwards compatibility. Did you know you can play a surprising amount of classic Xbox titles dating back from as early as late 2001? on a 2017 Xbox One X? I didn't until I started researching it, because I didn't even realise you could play classic Xbox games on the 360. Yeah, I'm a little bit behind. But how cool! Three generations worth of games being playable in one place. That is something that the PS4 and Switch wishes it could do. It's even backwards compatible with useless games nobody cares about. Wanna play, um, Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb? Or... Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy? Well, you can on the Xbox One. Yeah! It was this news that actually inspired me to replace a load of my PS2 games with classic Xbox titles for the sake of recording some of them at the best possible quality, because aside from emulating on PC, which barely works a lot of the time, there's no real way to experience PS2 games in decent quality aside from the PS3 HD collections of a few set titles. The PS4 doesn't allow you that, aside from a few downloadable PS2 ports on the PS Store, and when the first builds of the PS3s went out that could play PS2 games, most of them blew up! You can't even play PS3 on PS4 unless via a PlayStation now subscription. And as for the Switch, yeah, I know it's a portable cartridge system, but if Nintendo are able to port Wii U games onto it and charge you the exact same amount of money it would have been when it was brand new, and Doom 64 is coming out for it, along with the NES and SNES games on the online system, why not include more GameCube and Wii games on the store, or Nintendo 64 games? When it comes to the Wii as well, the gyro controls would be way better than the infrared sensor motion pointer anyway, and look, I'm not going to pretend I understand how consoles work or the system infrastructure, but you're telling me there's no way at all we can purchase PS1 games on the PS4 store and play them on it. This can't be run on this. Especially when PS1 games in particular are incredibly easy to emulate everywhere else. I don't get it! And while I don't get it, I don't get it! I DON'T GET IT! I don't know how many other ways I can say this without coming across as a floppy, but I'll try it once more. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is a great game, but I just do not think it's a 10 out of 10 by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> this is without a doubt one of the most engrossing open world games I've ever played and that nails the idea of total freedom better than any game has before it. The combat is good fun, the way to approach enemy encounters and puzzles are practically endless with the ability to physically manipulate the world, the sheer volume of secrets and surprises is amazing, the bosses are great even when they're pretty easy, the visuals and the music are spectacular, the strategic tension behind figuring out a path for your next vertical climb is great, the puzzles and the shrines are good, this stuff is all absolutely excellent, but if you ask me, it's all bent and twisted around a really uninteresting story that's delved out with a badly voice acted Zelda in totally ineffectual scenes. Don't you see? There's nothing more I can do! And once again, a totally mute and gormless Link even though they build the story around him and how he's supposed to be a legendary hero. Do you really remember me? A lock on camera that is very temperamental and doesn't let you switch targets without unlocking and relocking, which is useless in groups. A slow-mo spam attack system that activates whenever the hell it feels like, before, during, or even after an attack happens. Side quests that don't really go anywhere, don't reward you anything too spectacular, and don't even compensate you with XP, which ends up wasting your time. And most annoyingly, the weapon degradation. I'm fully aware there are supporters of this system all over the internet, and to be honest, I'm glad you like it. Good for you. Pat on your head with a loaf of bread. But after I've conquered a massive task or finished a very difficult battle, only to be rewarded an extremely powerful weapon that only lasts about 40 hits in total before breaking forever, 
I don't feel like I've progressed. Know why? Because I have no clue when or where I should use it without wasting it. There's weapon durability systems which are totally fine to include, but then there's weapons that feel like you're attacking with literal twigs for how fragile they are. This goes beyond finding more weapons and forcing you to experiment as well, since you don't find decent weapons often enough to justify experimenting with them. This kind of argument favours games like Uncharted a lot more since you have very small infantry space, but are constantly finding replacement weapons on the fly in chaotic battles and can even choose to keep them on you if you run out of ammo. I mean there's crafting and food in Breath of the Wild so why can't we just craft repair materials and rely on needing to find them to look after our favourite weapons that we earned ourselves instead of just having them break after a few minutes when it took us a lot to get them in the first place. When I found a tricky treasure chest or beat a really difficult boss encounter, I didn't feel like, oh my god, I found a really powerful weapon I can use. I thought, oh great, another powerful weapon that I don't want to use because I don't want to break it. I mean, the Master Sword in the game is a weapon that you can keep on recharging, so why can't they just have that with every other weapon? Or make the weapon pool smaller and have your favourite weapons be repairable so you feel like you can use it but you won't lose them forever. And while I'm on one, do you know what? I don't even like the European box art that much either. I mean, the US one, that's, that's cool. That's stylish. This, this looks like you caught Link in the middle of him weeing off the edge of a cliff. And by the way, I don't think God of War's a 10 out of 10 either. Man, oh man, you think my Breath of the Wild review like to dislike ratio was a little off? Take a look at this, sunshine. <laughs> Yikes, that's a big uh-oh from me. Where I still loved Breath of the Wild despite what I perceived to be flaws, God of War 2018 was a game that I enjoyed fine enough despite the flaws. Yeah, I just didn't click with this one as much as everyone else did. In terms of the characters and their relationships, I loved it, with this being my favourite incarnation of Kratos to this day. But with everything else, it felt like a step down from the previous classic hack and slash games. And hey, that's when the story wasn't being interrupted, like when your son is having an angry emotional outburst at you because you left him for hours and hours on his own, only for him to then start talking in tutorial speak less than 30 seconds later. Even if you take away the fact that compared to the original God of War 2005, you interact or fight with nowhere near as many Norse gods and monsters over the Greek gods and monsters, and take away the fact that you fight the same goddamn troll over and over again with different colours as a poor excuse for a boss battle when they could have used the endless sea of Norse creatures to fill those places in and kept them as regular enemies, and take away the fact that throughout the 30 plus hour adventure you're being built up to how terrible and destructive Odin and Thor are for everything you're doing, and then after a disappointing series of bosses you're then left alone with a teaser for the fight you should have had before the game just stops when you get a build up and satisfyingly epic conclusion in the original PS2 game. Yeah, taking away all of that, it's just not as smooth to play as I think it could have been. It's fine, but if you ask me, it's got a lot of problems. I get it, they wanted to give you a more mature story right behind Kratos' head so you're able to feel all the emotional weight right in your face, but when you try and combine this level of free-form movement and 360 degree dodge rolling with enemies surrounding you with a fixed perspective third-person camera, it causes its own sea of issues, all done for the sake of it just being another third-person action game because that's what people do now. This radar isn't enough here. I want to see more of what's going on around me. I can't plan my next move. I can barely see anything massive all around me that the radar doesn't help me avoid until the last minute when it's already too late. I can't immediately turn around by moving the left stick in the direction I want to go and have to use a delayed quick turn instead. Why can't I be locked into a strafe only when I'm aiming with the axe? Why do I need a strafe when I'm just fighting regularly? Other games have done this just fine and even God of War itself did it better. You can't even sprint without unlocking the camera and moving the camera in the direction you want to sprint. Sprint. Which then means if you're locked onto a very fast boss and need to make sure you see everything they do, you can't actually sprint while locking onto them, isn't that crap? It's just so damn cramped for such a fast paced and brutal game. Oh, well, except when you're stuck in the myriad of non-skippable walking scenes and climbing scenes that don't test you, don't add to the atmosphere, don't add to the characters, and then allow you to move again, but through train track level design that even when becoming a little bit more open, doesn't trust you to jump at your own accord. You know, like you used to be able to do. Which means that platforming is gone, jump dodging and jump combos are gone. Oh look, another stone monster boss. Oh look, a boss that's just a stronger version of every other basic enemy in that area. Whoa! Believe it or not though, 
I still liked the game more than I didn't. I just wanted to point out the things that I didn't understand about it for the sake of this video. If you want more of a detailed opinion on what I think about the game as a whole, then check my review up there for more details. Anyway, could this video about how much of a bastard I am with unpopular gaming opinions get any more inflammatory? Well, I don't know. This one is short and to the point. I don't mind Splatoon, but I've tried multiple times to get into Splatoon 1 and 2, but just can't stand how slow your movement speed is. Yes, I know, the whole point is that you turn into a squid and use that mechanic to move around the map faster while refilling your ink, but you know what I like to do in a shooting game? Move and shoot simultaneously, and the fact that you're stuck at a snail's pace whenever you need to shoot makes this some of the most unsatisfying gunplay in a competitive shooter, if you ask me. And in single player, when you find yourself walking around large levels with the only way to progress being constantly spraying on the floor for a bit, moving in squid form, running out of spray on the floor and so spraying the floor again and going into squid form again, you start thinking a lot more about how the ink gets inside the kids' bodies and then into the guns to be vomited back onto the floor and then sucked up again and deposited all over another player again and then like, what does it smell like? What does, where does it come from? Where does it go? I was going somewhere with this. Oh, what's that, Nintendo? You're gonna throw me into an online match with players that have dozens and dozens and dozens of hours more experience than me? Well, bust my beef! So you've made it this far. Well done, you. But that also means... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you've had the disease long enough for the rash to start. You might want to check your knees. Thanks for listening. Please share your garbage gaming opinions in the comments below. And if you do not mind, I have some cooking to get on with. So before you start the cookie wookie of the pasta, or as you see in the America's pasta, before you cook the pasta, you have to make sure it's thoroughly washed. Everybody and thank you so much for watching today's video. The outtakes will be on at the very very end of this video So please stay tuned for that. But first of all, um, I just want to say if you're upset or angry with me over this video That's your prerogative. You do you. You have the right to feel like that. I'm really sorry you feel like that That's not my intention with this video. It's just a bit of fun I have these opinions the reactions that I get from these kinds of videos are quite fun uh, But it is just mostly a laugh. I don't hate anybody that has a different opinion to me so you take that as you will. I'm really sorry if you're upset by it, but I mean, it is just a bit of fun at the end of the day, like most of my videos are, if not all of them. So there you go. But anyway, special thank you to all the people on screen right now that have helped support this channel via Patreon. Would not be able to do this without you guys, so thank you so much. And before the outtakes, special, special thank you to the top tier supporters for this month. Basil, Mitchell Reed, A.D. Thornton-Smith, Fart Rules, Iwaja, Nightshade96, MD The Dude, Exopaz, Matthew Hubble, Scoopaboop, Daniel LaRosa, GTFO, Brikachu, Matthew O'Donnell, Jacob Voiles, TARDIS Type 40, Caleb Sanders, Red Eyed Critic, Ray Slocum, Doom Guy, Luke Jones, J Man Crew, The Game Shed, Amdas Amdal, Scarmillion, Joshua Roberts, and Alex Van Kirk. Thank you so much, every single one of you amazing people. I don't get it! I don't get. <laughs> oh, bot. <but> no. <laughs> First off, does anyone. First off, better. First off, does any- <laughs> Brilliant. Three, two, one, go. Aha! First off, does anyone- First off, does anyone- <laughs> So- <laughs> First off, does anyone- I'm gonna be dreaming about this line. <laughs> first off, <laughs> first off, first off, first off, does anyone- First off, does anyone- do it a different way, my god. No. First oh. off, does anyone... First off, does anyone... Is this going to happen for every Why? game? Why? I know, I just want to do it for this one. First off, does any... Why is it... It's not going the right way, no matter what end I throw... First off, does anyone... <laughs> First off, does anyone... Why?